Isak Paredes, what, three for 27? Three for 27. Three for 27. Not a great night offensively. Great night defensively. He had a couple of nice defensive plays at third base. Uh, but the bat has been slow. He, I think last week he had a game against the Reds where he hit two doubles. Um, he had a hit yesterday. So those are his three hits since he became a Chicago Cub for the second time. Um, I guess the question here is, are, are we worried about his bat? No. Considering, well, let me finish. Considering go like since the beginning of July when he was even with the race still, it, it's been, it hasn't been good. Taking that into account, the answer is still no. Oh. And I will tell you that I, I appreciate the fact that the defense rebounded tonight. Because I feel like there is a tendency among professional baseball players where if you're slumping, you can kind of like the mentality can shift and then suddenly you're not doing well in the field. I like to when you rebound in the field, it feels like the good at bats are around the corner. And that's what I'm hoping kind of happens here. Yeah. Brennan, 27 plate appearances. That's yeah. it's a few. It's a few weeks. If I if we say, oh, I'm concerned about Isak Paredes over 27 plate appearances, then you're even sicker than us doing this show after the Cubs got shut out yet again. Okay, it's only been three weeks. Let's see what happens. The concern that I think is fair, even though it has been three weeks with the Cubs, it's been one week with it, the Cubs. It's been one week with the Cubs. I'm, yeah, COVID messes with my brain. I feel like he's been on the Cubs. Technically not even a week because he was traded to the Cubs last Tuesday and then he didn't play the next game, I don't believe. Am I am am I am I, I, I traded no, on no, that, that is correct. on Monday. Was it Monday? Then, okay. So they didn't play he didn't Monday. play Tuesday and then yeah, he played he, his first game of the Cubs was last Wednesday. So it hasn't I've been even been a week. I've been watching Isak play for the Cubs since he was seventeen. I remember him back in Mesa way back then before he, before your time even maybe Patrick. Uh, I I've been watching him for yet. a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you the youngest person on our staff? Uh no. No. I'm no, I'm 25. Yeah. Emma definitely 25. has to be the youngest. Yeah. Uh, man, you guys are babies. You know, one day yeah, you'll get are. gray hairs like us. But uh But it won't look as good as your hair. Yeah. Yeah. Brendan, Brendan yeah. is Brendan spends all of his time on the West Coast, so he's actually 55, but just looks really good. <laughs> Whoa, it's not but uh, false false claims out there, Patrick. <laughs> a, lot, um, a lot of sunscreen, just like you. How about that? Yeah, I'll say this just to acknowledge what a lot of the YouTube chat and what everyone is saying on social media. I mean, trade on Sunday. That's yeah. There we are. My head. I'll say this. Um, Paredes is bat his at bats. I feel like he's giving good at bats. Um, I think Craig Council or someone mentioned his 12 pitch at bat that he had, I want to say on Friday, that kind of ignited their offense a little bit, in which the Cubs ended up winning that game. Um, he had a hit and a walk yesterday. Um, you know, tonight wasn't great. I will say that, but no one in the Cubs offense looked good tonight. Um, so whatever. I just, I understand a large majority of people are going to argue about this probably for the rest of the season and into the off season because everyone, and me included, I, I mean, me, you, Brennan, and Corey for sure were Christopher Morell's biggest defenders on this podcast. But because he was so beloved by a lot of fans, I think it's just something that people are going to continue to talk about. And I, I don't care that Morrell hit two homers in two games. He struck he struck out multiple times in multiple games since then as well, and he had two errors in one game uh, for the Rays as well in just this past week. So um, the Rays are even getting a little bit of what we got to deal with Morrell this year as well. I will, I've said this as well that I think Morrell has the higher ceiling with the bat. Um. But I sat here and talked about the underlying metrics for him plenty the last three and a half months, and people didn't want to hear it. And now people are talking about Paredes' underlying metrics and saying, like, oh, this guy's really bad. And it just, it's so, to me, it's, it's very funny when people want to shape their own narratives. I get it if we're two months down the road and he's not hitting. I totally get it. But 27 at-bats, play appearances, whatever. Freaking slow your roll, people. That's all I can say. I feel like it's the same 
group of people that are also giving up on Craig Council. Yeah. Well, and it's not even just our YouTube chat. It's been all over social no, media, no, too. No, I, yeah. And that's why on Absolutely social media not. for me, I just kind of turn it into a joke. Like every time Paredes makes a great defensive play, Cubs win the trade. Every time he grounds out to short, Rays win the trade. Like whatever. That That's where I'm at. Like I feel like we have to wait it out a little bit. You know, like I still think that the trade could potentially work out for both teams because – at the end of the day, I still think the Cubs move Cubs move Morel because he they couldn't find a position for him to play, and as he, we've already seen with him with the Rays, he, it hasn't worked out very well defensively for him over there yet either. And if we're gonna judge it after not even a week, like a lot of people have been, like you have to acknowledge that he still has the same flaws over there for them too. So, I I think that Paredes being competent defensively and uh, you know, again, giving you decent at bats in terms of working pitch counts, making contact, not striking out. Um, I think the hits will come eventually. I think he's still just getting kind of settled in here. And also, like I said, he had been struggling since the beginning of July. So we'll see when he gets out of the slump. Hopefully he does. So that way people stop talking about this like whole trade thing because like it's really annoying at this point. This gets viewed and I understand why as a 1v1 vacuum decision with the context involved it makes sense from both sides if you want to look at the one we 1v1 vacuum discussion morel has a higher ceiling it's obvious he's got top five overall bat speed the metrics you talked about were very encouraging early in the year he's someone if it all clicks is one of the better hitters in the league. The question is, how likely is it that it all clicks in time to line up with this Cubs competitive window? The Cubs have every one of their top hitting prospects in AAA. There's going to be limited runway. At some point in the next year and a half, they need to have some certainty. They can't go in with an experiment at every single position. We've already seen that play out this year in a disastrous fashion. So I understand Jed's perspective. I'm going to sacrifice the higher ceiling with the lower ceiling may cause some concern for fans, but the defense at third base, the defense back up at second base, the unique pull side profile, the very unique swing decision and contact profile is more likely to yield productive value for the team. And the sacrifice is that 40 plus home run uh, caliber guy in Morrell, but you may get that elsewhere and you may get the opportunity to fully explore that possibility in a different position because you don't have to keep experimenting and risking that at third base. I understand it, but I also do share some of the overall angst with letting someone like Morrell go. But unfortunately, I will probably stand by this. I believe the Cubs are a little bit too late on a few of their decisions and testing guys out of certain positions or making 40 man decisions, which I do push back on. And even Ballesteros is one of the examples where I don't quite see the value on the 40 man versus promoting the development of someone like Ballesteros right now. But these are the decisions the Cubs front office makes, and it will determine if they're going to be with this Cubs team in the next year and a half. I, I think you bring a make a good point about, you know, the guys who just got promoted to triple A on top of the fact of Biosteros and, and Owen Casey. Like I don't know how these guys were going to be able to exist with Morell on the roster. I think like that's and that's why them not being able to find Morell a position is a big reason why I think they moved him. You know, like Craig Craig Council historically does not use a singular DH. He's never been the type to mm. just have one guy in the lineup in that role every night all year. It has been a rotational thing, whether it's for rest or for whatever reason, or like now with Cody Bellinger where he physically cannot play in the field, uh, or at least he comfortably cannot <laughs> play in the field. Right. And so you still want his bat in the lineup. Obviously didn't really do much tonight, but still – you want that bat in the lineup. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have that bat in the lineup. You wouldn't be able to do that if you had Morrell as your everyday DH, or at least he would be on the bench. Or 
potentially a liability in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. It's uh, it's a very, uh, I, again, It's I know this isn't going to be the last time we talk about it. It's just, I think a lot of fans just don't fully understand the reasoning behind it. So trying to explain it the best we can, at least from our perspective, I think. Yeah. It, and I think it's fair what we're saying. It's not, like, again, me, I know for sure, me, Brennan, and Corey were very much still believers of Morell. We'd come in here and get shit on by the YouTube chat every single day whenever we would use his underlying metrics as a def- as, as a defense mechanism, you know? Like, it's, uh, you know. But I, to I, be I, clear, to be clear, again, looking at a player – individually and making those claims as we did that we were confident in Morel does not mean it's certain it happens. It's just the, the likelihood it happens is not unrealistic. And you know how I fan, I always look for the more extreme outcomes. I dying for the Cubs to get a 50 plus home run guy and Morel has the talent to do that. But with all these discussions we've ever had, I don't like risking things. I want the Cubs to be a 95 win team. So those experiments we're talking about, I need to happen in the background of a Rizzo Bryant middle of the order. It's not sufficient for this team to go into the year expecting Morel to produce like that as their cleanup hitter. That was a risk that was too much for the 2024 Cubs, undeniably. And again, it may cost Jed Hoyer his job, those fringe decisions. I don't want to get that confused that it was appropriate for the Cubs to go into the season doing that. But at the same time, his top tier talent is extremely interesting and exactly why an organization like the Rays made their risk in giving up Paredes, even at that cheaper arbitration price, because they, like many other fans, believe in that profile, and that's the gamble they wanted to make. We all silly like the mayor. 